today. Um, Moses and the Israelites miraculously came forth from Egypt by crossing the Red Sea, not on the top of the sea. They didn't have boats. Israel's deliverance from slavery pictures our salvation. We were slaves to sin, and Satan had his way with us. And they were slaves to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had his way with them through the cruel taskmasters. We've been delivered by the blood of the Lamb, and they were saved from the death of the firstborn by the blood of a lamb on their door, on their lintel and the doorpost. Now the Israelites have a difficult journey ahead. The Christian life is a journey, and, and sometimes it's a difficult one, especially after you get a few years on you. <laughs> I can attest to that. So, we are off of the broad path that leads to destruction. We're off of that path. We're now on the narrow way that leads to eternal life. Amen. There are many trials along the way on that path that we're on. The Israelites have a lot of trials along the way to the promised land. Most of them by their own doing. The journey, the path, the way, or whatever you want to call it of the Christian life also has trials. It isn't, you're not on an easy street just because the Lord is your Savior. It's not, it's not easy. God didn't say it would be easy. The word says you will be cast down, but not destroyed. So we live in a territory of the enemy. Sometimes the path is a steep one in our path. Sometimes it's boulder strewn, tripping hazards. Sometimes we're in the dark. It takes the gospel light to guide us. Psalm 119, verse 105. You're familiar with that one? Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The lamp shows where you are, unto your feet. That's where you are. And that illuminates the path, what's before you. That's the word. That's the power of God's word that illuminates that. So that you won't trip over the hazards. But if you're not in the word, you won't have that. So Exodus chapter 15, starting with verse number 1, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. Starts out, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and, and, and uh, driver he has hurled into the sea. I don't know if Moses composed this song, but it seems like he did. But they all sang it. These celebrators had been slaves. They had been in bondage to Pharaoh. They had seen God work the wonders against the Egyptians. They had seen the plagues. They knew that God was with them, that God was leading them, that God was there when the death angel passed over the houses where the blood of a lamb was applied. And now they have escaped. Can you imagine their excitement? No more bondage, no more slavery. What's ahead? They don't know. But they made a promise to God in Mount Horeb that they would be his people and they would follow him. This, of course, this, that was after this. Verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Does that sound familiar? That's us too, isn't it? He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Verse 3, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. 
The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the sea. Pharaoh came after them. He was a hard-hearted man. Hard-hearted man. He came after them with, it says, 600 of his best chariots with officers over all of them and all the rest of the chariots and his army. He, he came after them with everything he had. The song praises the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for being the warriors who brought them out of slavery, for being the warrior, the God of their forefathers, for being the warrior and bringing them out of slavery. That's what the song does. Verse 5, the deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Moses said, you are not going to see those any, those, those, you're not going to see them anymore. And they didn't see them again because they're under the water of the sea. Verse 6, your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy, continuing in the greatest of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like rubble. Those who opposed you in opposing the people of God, they were opposing God. When Satan comes against you, he's coming against God. And he knows that. And that's his purpose. Verse 8, by the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. Remember, they were singing this as a song to the Lord. Verse 9, the enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. That was their enemy, the Egyptians. But we have an enemy that has the same kind of murderous threats against the people of God. Amen. Who among the gods... Is like you. Lord, who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. That's going to happen again. Amen. It's going to happen again. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. That's what we, that's what we anticipate. That's, that's what we're waiting for. And verse 14, the nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. So we have a transition here. They're praising God for what he is going to do. They were praising God for what he has done to the Egyptians, and now they have escaped, and now they're praising him for what he's going to do. Verse 15, the chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as if they will be as still as a stone. Until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. It's a picture of the rapture of the rapture. We're gonna pass by. There's gonna be nothing but turmoil left down here. Amen. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. Verse 18, the Lord reigns forever and ever. The praise is all about God in this song, the song of Moses, Exodus 15. It's all about God. 
In verse 19, when Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and rider. He is hurled into the sea. This was a great celebration. Timbrels and dancing and singing, composing a song to honor and glorify the God who set them free. The Israelites have been in Egypt for 430 years. They probably didn't know where they were going unless it had been handed down to them through the generations where they came from. Canaan was their destination. God was going to give that land, promise it to Abraham. But this was an enormous celebration. All of them participated. Think how noisy it would have been. They were free. They should never see the taskmasters again. They would never see them again. The Egyptians would not be pursuing them. They were all dead in the Red Sea. The whole army, all the chariots, even the horses were dead under the water. So they had to express their gratitude, celebrate with singing, singing the praises of God. Maybe they thought that everything would be hunky-dory. <laughs> I don't even know what that means, actually. But maybe they thought they would just glide into the promised land. It would have been... A lot easier if they hadn't rebelled against God and resorted to idolatry, sentencing them to 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It was impossible for them to cross that sea. They didn't have any boats. Even if they did have boats, 630 thousand men plus women and children you'd have to have a whole lot of boats they didn't have any they couldn't save themselves it would take a thousand boats to bring them all across it would be like d-day in world war ii we were in bondage sin once ruled your life And it was impossible for you to save yourself. You couldn't get across that sea. They were spared from death by the blood of the Lamb. We were spared from death of sin by the blood of the Lamb. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. You can't possibly be good enough to earn a place in heaven. You can't be good enough. Jesus said you must be born again to Nicodemus. It took an act of God to divide the sea. So a million and a half or two or three million people could walk through as it were on dry ground. And it takes an act of the Holy Spirit to bring you to salvation. Someone shares the word with you. you. You hear it. And it rolls off of you. It did me. Until the Holy Spirit tears down the veil that's over your heart. And the Spirit brings conviction. At that point, you can say yes to God or not. You have a free will. You can be convicted. You can have the veil down. You can hear the word. You can feel like you need to come to Christ and just say no and walk away from it. And people do that. You can stand at the divided sea and not go through. I don't think there were any of them that did that. 
But you can do that. Stand there and not go through. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the word says. So we have as much cause to celebrate as the Israelites did. They escaped from their enemies. They came, out of the, they came out of bondage and were saved, just as they were. Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. That's just an awesome thing. It's a miracle. We can see the work of God every day in our lives. Of course, we all have aches and pains. We live in a fallen world. <coughs> But this is not our home. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. The born again believers, this is not our home anymore. Once we were part of the world, but not anymore. We have cause to celebrate. Just like they did. Celebrate in your heart. Celebrate with your mouth. Celebrate in praise and worship. Celebrate with singing. Can you picture that? Singing and dancing and jumping up and down and timbrels and whatever music instruments they had. Can you picture that? So excited because they were set free. And we've been set free. We've been set free from the law of sin and death. It no, no longer has mastery over us like the Egyptians had mastery over them. It doesn't have any mastery. It's not your master. Sin is not your master unless you let it be. Psalm 150, first six verses. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing, surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our mandate is to praise Him. Yes. So then, Moses did the unlikely. Something ridiculous in our, in our own thinking. Going down to verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur for three days. They traveled in the desert without finding water. Remember, they didn't know where they were going. Since they didn't have batteries, their GPS wasn't working. They, didn't, they wouldn't have had batteries, so forget about the GPS. So when they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Merah. Verse 24, so the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. God puts us to the test. Yes. There are tests all the time. Maybe we don't see it as a test, but it's there. The tests are there. God wants to see if we're going to cling to Him in faith or do things our own way. Our lives are full of challenges. Fires, floods, sickness, setbacks of all kinds. Do we let God in when that happens? Are we in the habit of seeking God's will in every situation? Or we just close ourselves in with it and sulk? <laughs> Throwing wood into the water to make it drinkable seems to be nonsense. But Moses did it. 
Sometimes you have to do something that's nonsensical because God is leading you to do something ridiculous. But that's ridiculous in your own mind. You lean not unto your own understanding. Amen? Amen. There was no way in the natural that Moses could make the water safe to drink. He could have said, let's go on and, and find drinkable water somewhere else. Let's go over the mountain. Maybe there's a river over there. He could have sent scouts out in different directions to see where there might be a water source. He could have said, let's try digging a well. He didn't try anything of his own thinking. He cried out to the Lord. Sometimes after we exhaust all of our own thinking and nothing works, then we cry out to the Lord. <laughs> but Moses cried out to the Lord first. Maybe that's a good example for us. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Notice that it says all of your ways. In all your ways. And it says submit to him. So Moses practiced submitting. Right from the burning bush, he resisted. And then he finally submitted. He knew God. From the burning bush experience forward, he always knew that he could depend on God. God spoke to him, and he responded to that. We should always know that we can depend on God. From our mom moment of coming out of bondage, that is from out of sin. From that moment of crossing our Red Sea. From the moment of our salvation. We know that our God is able to deliver us. Then going down to verse 26. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, not, not our eyes, but his eyes, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. The blessings would come with conditions. Listen carefully. That was a condition. Do what is right. That was a condition. Not what's right to us, but what's right to God, who saved us. Verse 27, they came to Elam, where there are 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. So they camped, had respite where the good water was. God gave them a refreshing relief. He loves us. He cares for us. He gives us times of refreshing. He leads us beside the quiet waters in Psalm 23. All good things come from God. He knows what we need. And he knows what's best for us. Sometimes what we want with a, with a passion isn't what's best for us and isn't what we need. Amen. Sooner we realize that and wrap our mind around it, the quicker that we'll be, I'll just, I'll just say the better off we'll be. He knows what's best. He set them free. He set us free. He set you free from sin and death. They praised him. We should praise him. They did the non-comfort zone things. If you could picture what that was like, the Red Sea was stood up in a wall on both sides, way up high over their heads, and they're going to walk through there. 
Would you be afraid that water would cover you? No, because God stood it up there. It was impossible. It was a miracle. So that wasn't a comfort zone for them to walk through there, but they did it. We should be willing to get out of our comfort zone. God expected them to listen and to do His will. We should do no less. Amen? Amen. To, to listen to God. Pay attention to what He wants us to do and do His will. Even if it's out of our comfort zone. Even if it makes us even if it makes us feel a little weird <laughs> to do it. It's, even if it's discomforting and strange to us. Last uh, week, Lori was here, and she had us all standing up while we were singing. That was nice. That's a gift that she has to stand. People have to stand up and to encourage people to. She'll be back. She's working today. But, it's, but if you have a sore back, it's out of your comfort zone to be standing there. I know. I was sitting there. I have a sore back when I'm standing. When I go fishing, I've got to find a log to sit on. I can't be standing that long. But it's a comfort zone. Is our comfort the most important thing to us? Sometimes. That's why we spend so much time and money on doctors. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to be praising God all the time. All the time. I like it when we're all down around here. And just praising God all together with that closeness. I like that. I like that. When we sang praise Him, praise Him. That was nice. It was nice. So maybe we'll do more of that. Maybe we'll do more of that. Would you stand? I'm going to turn you loose. <laughs> um, this week, be praying for the people you don't see here today. Be praying for John and Jan. Be praying for Dewey and Shirley. Just be praying for them this week. Be praying for Boyd. Yeah, this week, just be praying for them every day. They're part of the family. They're part of us. Wednesday night, sandwich night at 6 o'clock. Don't forget. Bring your teeth. Dear Lord, we thank you for this family, for every believer in the house here today. We just thank you so much for them. We thank you for the love that you give us for each other, Lord. There are no contentions or difficulties of that kind like other churches have. We're grateful for that, Lord. And as we go our separate ways, we just ask that you go with us, Lord, and bring us victory in whatever situation we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name, amen.